Well, what I believe impacts what I will do. At least it should. If I say I believe something, it should impact how I live. What you believe should transform what you do. When you say, I believe, you can say, therefore, I will do certain things. And if I say I believe something, if I say, man, I believe this with all my heart, but what I do doesn't bear that truth out at all, after a while, you start wondering, does he actually believe anything? If I say I believe this, but my life doesn't show it, there's a point where you start to question what I really believe. We're in the series in the book of Romans, and here's what we're learning from the book of Romans. What I believe, my orthodoxy, my actual orthodox belief, right biblical belief, directly impacts how I live, my orthopraxy. Right believing leads to right living. And so as we walk through the book of Romans, this first part of the series, the last six weeks, we talked about I believe. We talked about the reality of sin. I believe that sin is real. The Bible teaches that. The sin is real, that we've rebelled against God. It separates us. And it's worse than we think. But also we learned in chapter 2 of Romans that God is righteous. And he, and he can make us righteous. We can't make ourselves righteous. We can't be legalistic or judgmental and kind of fix everything. But God can make us righteous through Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? Then we got, continue on Romans 3 and 4, and we discovered that God is faithful. He's a faithful God. Even when we're faithless, He remains faithful. And He calls us to put faith in Jesus, and if we do, it changes everything. Do you believe that? Do you believe that sin is bad? Do you believe that God is righteous and He can make you righteous? Do you believe that God is faithful and He wants you to come to Him through faith? Do you believe that God is the bringer of peace and hope? Anybody here need a little bit more peace and hope these days? Have you noticed that things are a little tense in our world? <laughs> Maybe we need a little peace, a little bit of hope. Well, God says, I can give that to you. And then Romans goes on to say that God is the giver of salvation. That if, that if we believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and confess with our lips that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. Do you believe that God makes a way for salvation? And then last week we talked about the fact that God is sovereign. Do you believe that God is on the throne? Even when the world seems out of control, God is on the throne. Even when our country seems out of control, God is on the throne. Even when your home and your life feels out of control, can you say, God is on the throne? Do you believe that he is sovereign? If you believe these things, then it should impact how you live your life. And, and there's this word in, in, in Romans 12.1. I invite you to turn in your Bibles, on your tablets, on your phones, and your app there to Romans chapter 12. And we're going to look at verses 1 and 2, just two verses. We had a week a few weeks ago where we looked at three chapters of the Bible in one sermon. Now we're going to look at two verses. The whole sermon today is just on these two verses, but these two verses are filled with things that we have to understand. And the first word in Romans 12.1 is kind of the hinge that the whole book of Romans turns on. Romans 1 through 11 is all about orthodoxy, what we believe, believing the right things. Romans, Romans 12 through 16 is all about orthopraxy, living the right way. And here's the hinge. Therefore... Therefore, if you believe these things, therefore, I will live this way. I was, I was being trained in, in, in outreach uh, by a pastor, a guy named James Kennedy. This was about 30 years ago at Coral Ridge Church in, in Florida. I was being trained in sharing faith, and he, made this, he said this thing. I'd heard, I've heard it since, but he said it made sense. He says, every time in the Bible, every time you read the word therefore, you have, you have to ask the question, what is it there for? If it says therefore... Well, what's it there for? Because when it says therefore, it's building on what came before. And, and, and what the Apostle Paul is saying is, if you believe that sin is real and a problem, if you believe that God is righteous and he can make you righteous, if you believe that God is faithful and you can put your faith in him, if you believe that God is the giver of hope and the giver of peace, if you believe that God is sovereign and on the throne, if you believe that salvation comes through Jesus Christ, if you believe all these things, therefore, live in a new way. I will live differently if I believe those things are true. So we're going to walk through Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and we're moving to this section of Romans. It's what I call unleashing orthopraxy. Just, I mean, unleashing right living. If you get Romans 1 through 11 and what you believe, and you live out Romans 12 through 16, you will be a different person. You will not be the same friend. You will not be the same husband or wife. You will not be the same neighbor. You will not be the same employer or employee. You will not be the same student. You will be, look different if you believe God's word and follow it. So listen to Romans 12, 1 and 2. 
and just let them, again, this is the hinge, this is the turning point. All these things we say we believe as Christians, if you're not yet a Christian, if you become one, these are core things to what Christians believe. Therefore, look at Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Oh God, we come to you today, whether we're in our cars in the parking lot, whether we're here in the courtyard, whether we're at home in our own home or traveling for business somewhere in a hotel somewhere scattered around the world, wherever we are today, we come to you and we ask that you will speak to us through your word. That because we know what we believe, you will change who we are. And I pray very specifically that every one of us will hear the quiet voice of your Holy Spirit speak to us about one area of our lives that needs to be brought into alignment with your will. That we could surrender something to you today that needs to be surrendered to make our lives more good and perfect and pleasing in your sight. So speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I was preparing this message, and as I was thinking about all of you, I really felt like God wants us to kind of pause and identify one area in our lives. That, we, that when we look at our life and we say, we know what God's will is and I know how I'm living, you know, the, what I believe and what I practice, where there's some, uh, maybe we're out of alignment. You know when in a car, when your wheels get out of alignment, you start driving, it starts to brrrr, and it kind of brumbles and bumbles and then, and then eventually the tire wears out on the side and, and you got all kinds of problems because the alignment's not set up. What is one area in your life where how you're living and what you believe just don't line up? And I know for a fact that all of us have those because we're human beings, and we struggle. And God's Word calls us to live certain kind of lives that we can struggle with. So as I was thinking about this, I thought in my heart that I needed to ask all of you and give a moment for just us to say, God, what's one area where what I believe and how I live just don't line up? So as I was preparing this message, I was going to challenge you to think of one area. I was going to say to all of you, don't come up with four or eight or 15 areas. Just say, Lord, show me one area. Don't, don't overwhelm yourself, pick one area. But until the first service this morning, I kept thinking of four areas in my life that, where I look and go, the way I know I should live and how I live, how I speak, how I think, it just doesn't line up with what God wants. I got a four areas. And, and you're probably some of you are thinking, well, pastor, what are those areas? None of your business. How dare you even ask? Seriously, you people, no. But I mean, that, you know, but there, there's areas where I know God wants me to think a certain way. My mind wanders. God wants me to speak a certain way. My tongue can be too short. I mean, I know there's areas that don't line up. But during the first service, during the, kind of a moment of quiet, God actually put on my heart which was the one I need to really focus on. Here's what I want to do. I want to take about 15 seconds. And I, for you, all of you at home, in your cars over here, in the courtyard, just kind of quiet your heart and say, Lord, will you show me one area that, that I know what I believe and I know how I should be living, but just up to right now, or maybe I'm back, I was doing great for a while, now I'm off the track. But there needs to be alignment between my beliefs and how I live. And ask God to give you, just say, God, just show me one area that you want to grow in me, that you can kind of think about that area as we walk through the sermon. Just take a moment quietly and just talk and say, God, show me one area that you want to see my life come in alignment and my behavior with what I believe. Lord, for some people, that area is something you've been just kind of telling them for weeks or months. Get it right. Align with me. Your life will be better. And they haven't heard it with enough clarity, but Lord, let them hear it now. For some, it may be something out of the blue they hadn't even thought about. But all of a sudden, right there by the whisper of your spirit, they just know there's an, a, an attitude, a behavior, a thought, whatever it is, that needs to come into alignment. Lord, we pray as we walk through Romans 12, these two verses particularly, you'll speak to our hearts and that our lives would come into alignment with what we believe and what you call us to do and be. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Well, look with me again at Romans 12, 1 and 2. Since we're only looking at two verses, I'm going to read these about four or five times in the sermon. I want them to really get into our minds and into our hearts. So listen to these words again. Therefore, since you believe all these things, Romans 1, 3, 11, since these are all true, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, it's not that I suggest or I kind of think you ought to, I'm urging the strongest way possible, I urge you, pay attention, this is a big deal, I urge you, my brothers and my sisters, this is for everybody, in view of God's mercy, you know, in your life, you live in the view of, and of, of the mercy of God. Think about this. If it weren't for the mercy of God, if God had not, if God had treated us according to what our lives deserve, man, our life, we'd be in trouble. If it weren't for the mercy of God, where would you be right now? So Paul says, I ur- therefore, I urge you, in view of God's mercy, listen to this, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. In the ancient world, they didn't kind of break themselves up in all these different parts, like body, soul, spirit. It was really, your body was a picture of your, all of you. It's like take your whole self and say, I'm on the altar. You know, offer all that you are. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. That's what worship looks like, your whole life given to God. And do not conform to the pattern of this world. There's ways that the world thinks and functions that God says, don't, don't be conformed by that. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Think the thoughts of God. Know what you believe and stand on that. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. You'll know God's will. And I love this. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Do you know that God's will for your life is good, pleasing, and perfect? You know what we think sometimes? We think if I follow God's will and God's ways, he's going to take away all my fun and my life's going to just be miserable. No. God's will and ways are good, pleasing, and perfect and will lead to a better life than we can come up with on our own. And and so that's God's desire. That's what God wants to do. So let me ask this question. How is your belief, what you know you believe, and your behavior aligned? When you say, I believe this, are you living it out? How's the alignment in your own life? I mean, I I believe that fire will burn me if I touch it. So I don't touch a stove and I don't touch fire. I line those things up. I believe my wife is trustworthy and faithful. So I'm not kind of watching her all the time and worrying. I trust her. I believe hard work is the best way to live your life. You should work as hard as you can at everything. Therefore, when I get something to do, I try to do it at 100%. What I believe impacts how I live in every area of life. I believe that this book is true from beginning to end. So I read it every day to get it in my mind and my heart and transforming my life and living, you know, living it out through my hands and what I do. Because I believe that, I live it out. How is your belief aligned with your behavior and your behavior aligned with your belief? So let's walk through Romans 12, 1 and 2, and let's learn from what God has to say to us. First, we need to learn that we should be surrendering your whole self, surrendering our whole self to God. Look at Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, and here's what I want to focus in. Focus in on for a moment. In view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, a holy sacrifice, a pleasing sacrifice to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. God has been merciful to us. In view of that mercy, because God has been gracious and merciful and good to us, in view of all of that, we should give our whole selves to God. When you think about following God, When you think about being a Christian, do you think about it this way? Well, I give God an hour and 15 minutes every week when I go to church. And it takes me like 12 minutes to drive there and 12 minutes to drive back. So he's getting like an hour and 45 minutes. That's pretty good. I mean, that's that's the part of my week that belongs to him. Maybe I read the Bible for five minutes every morning. So I give him that too. You know, I do that, you know, every day of the week, you know, so five times four is 20 because I don't do it every day of the week. And so, okay, so then I'm giving God like two hours a week. Isn't that enough? And yet the call here is to, is to offer your, your bodies as a living sacrifice, your whole self placed on the altar. Are, are you giving God your physical life? God, my, phys- my body and who I am physically, yes, I give that to you. It's on the altar. My spiritual life, my worship of you, it's on the altar. My relational life, do you give your relationships to God? Because that's what it's talking about, putting your whole self on the altar. Your recreational life, what you do in your free time. 
Oh, I'm not giving my free time to God. That's my time. That's me time. That's, that's, that's for me. No, this is, this, the idea here is you give everything to God. You mean, what, what, everything. You know, my financial life. Now you've pushed too far, Pastor. Now you've crossed the line. Now everything. All you earn, all your capacity, all your gifts, all your abilities, all a gift from God. Your occupational life, your educational life, everything in life. It all belongs to God. And if we say to God, I will give my life as a living sacrifice, I'm going to give my whole self to you, that means we're surrendering everything to God. And it's holy to him. He loves it. And this, we're told, pleases God. So here's a question for you. What is your next step of surrender? And do you have the courage to take it? What is an area of your life? And hopefully the Holy Spirit kind of whispered something to you when we were being quiet a moment ago. But what's one area that you say, you know, I, I just, I'm holding that too tightly. I'm keeping that for me. Actually, honestly, I don't even really want God to be part of that. That's, that's, my, that's my thing. What's an area that you need to surrender to God and give over to him? Just think about these questions. Where am I holding back from God? What am I holding back? Okay, God, you can have this and this, but not that. That's, that's mine. Why am I holding it back? What's keeping me from really relying on God and trusting in Him? How can I surrender one more area to Jesus? This is what I found. This has been the journey of my life as a Christian now for, for over four decades. It's just, it's just learning to surrender an area to God. And once God, that's kind of under God's control, he says, oh, by the way, Kevin, there's this over here. And I'm like, oh, I didn't notice that before. I mean, I'm, 40, I'm more than 40 years in, and there's areas that God's saying, okay, there's an attitude here that we need to work on. I'm like, well, God, why didn't you show me that 40 years ago? He says, you weren't even ready for that one. We were working on these other 14 things. This is what's called, the theologians call the journey of sanctification. Sanctification, sanctification is becoming more and more like Jesus. When you become a Christian, it's in a moment when you put your faith in Jesus. But the rest of your life is a journey of becoming more like him. And that's, that is truly a journey that lasts a lifetime. What are you holding back from Jesus? Have you given him your fears? And the best place to bring your fears is the feet of Jesus to the foot of the cross. Have you given those to him? Your free time, your space, and you're like, God, I give that to you. What, what if in my free time he calls me to do something that I, I wouldn't want to be doing? Well, he, he might do that. You know, I used to, I'll tell you a little story. I didn't share this first service, just for second service, okay? Um, I used to watch sports on TV until about 35 years ago. I love sports. I could watch, and I remember, I remember one time watching curling. You know, where they push a rock and they turn it and then they go, they sweep the, I, anybody, raise your hand if you ever seen it. They go, wee, wee, sweep. They, okay, it's just this bizarre game that's played like in cold places. And not a lot of it here in, in, in uh, Monterey. But, but I, 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 love, I, could, I could get transfixed by watching any sport. And about 35 years ago, God put on my heart, I've got some work for you to do. And God gave us a chance to do some writing. And I said, well, I, I can't find time for that. But I found I had tw about 20 hours a week I watched sports. That was my me time, right? I felt like God, like God said, I want you to write, write stuff for me. And so stop watching sports. And 35 years ago, I stopped watching sports on TV. I still play sports. I still love sports, but I don't follow any sports. I let myself record golf on Sunday and watch that kind of fast forward because it's a little slow. But, uh, but that's been my journey. But in the last 35 years, my wife and I have written over 120 small group study guides and 12 books. We wouldn't have done any of those things if I had sat and watched sports. Now, I'm not criticizing sports at all, and you can watch sports. I'm telling you, for me, when I said, God, you can have my free time, he said, okay, I'll take it. But I look back now at what God did, has done through the other things I do rather than watching the sports, and I go, that was a better, that's been a better way to spend my time. Will you give God everything, including your free time? Will you offer God your finances? Will you offer God your future, your plans, your dreams? God, I can't have this dream, I can't have this plan, but God, I want to be in your will. Align yourself with the will of God. Surrender to him. Surrender everything to him. Continuing on in Romans 12. A surrendered, a surrendered life is an act of worship. When we surrender all that we are, we put ourselves on the altar and say, God, you can have all of me. I'm a living sacrifice given to you. It's an act of worship. Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. And here's what I want to focus on now. This is your true and proper worship. 
This is your, you know, give me your whole life to God is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. This is your true and proper worship. Now you might be thinking, well, wait, no, no, wait, wait, no. Worship is like we come to a worship service and then during this worship service for like 20 minutes, we sing worship songs. I mean, worship is singing songs, right? What are you saying? Your, your, actual, your, your, your true and proper worship is this. God hears my whole life. That's the greatest act of worship you can do. Because when your whole life is given to God, your songs of praise sound different. When your whole life is given to God, your acts of service are done with a different motive. When your whole life is given to God, everything falls into alignment. Your best act of worship is every day saying, God, I'm all yours. You gave everything for me. Now I give myself to you this day to live for you and to serve you. In the ancient world, they brought, they brought sacrifices to worship. It was sometimes be grain offerings, or they would bring different kinds of gifts. Sometimes it would be uh, animals. We won't get into that. That's a whole other sermon. But you know, they'd bring all these different offerings, and they'd give them. And we say, now, now you make yourself the offering. Your whole life, all that you are. And he says, God looks and says, now that's worship. I delight in that. He loves our songs. He loves that we gather like this. But man, what he really wants is us to do this while our whole life is given to him. And everything gets a new perspective when we're surrendered to him. So here's a question. How can you worship through your whole day? If you say, God, I give you my whole life, all that I am, it means my entire day, all that I do belongs to Jesus. How do I surrender to God throughout a whole day? Now here's just some, here's some thoughts. You wake up in the morning and either roll out of bed and get on your knees or just lay in bed for a minute and say, God, this day, all that I do till I lay back again tonight, it's yours. And I belong to you. I put myself on your altar and you can have all that I do and say and think and am this day. Can you imagine if you said that first thing in the morning before you kind of started your day and doing stuff? You say, okay, just slow down. God, I'm yours today. Then you go to school, you go to work and you say, God, I'm at school today. I'm at work today. Okay, I'm yours this day. My work is yours. My school work is yours. Let me do everything the best I can as if I'm doing it for you and for your glory. You look at your schedule. And, and what, what if you started in your day and you looked at your schedule for the day and you prayed through your schedule? So I looked at my schedule for tomorrow, for Monday. I said, I'm going to pray through my schedule for tomorrow. I did this a little bit earlier. And so I looked, I had 14 different distinct things I'm doing tomorrow. I prayed through every one of those things and gave it to the Lord. It took me about two and a half minutes. But I prayed through my whole day and just, what if, what if you just every day looked at your calendar, if you keep a calendar, some of you don't, you just got to kind of flow, but some of you go, man, I have to keep a calendar, I've got meetings and everything, and you pray through each one of them. And it might be, Lord, Lord, bless this, Lord, guide me, oh, give me wisdom, oh, Lord, that's going to be a tough one, help me keep my mouth, watch my mouth on that one, but just pray through it, right? And give it to the Lord. You're surrendering, you're laying yourself on the altar. Your free time, So I got this free time, Lord, is there anything you want me to do other than what I've got planned to do? Your evening time, I know when your day's winding down. You say, okay, this is when I either watch shows or play games. Our culture is a show-watching, game-playing culture. Almost every human being who's part of this American culture almost every day has a time in the evening for an hour, two, three, four, five, six, or eight hours that it's shows and games. That's just part of our culture. What if you stopped and said, okay, God, I'm going to look at what I plan on watching, and I'm going to ask this question, is this something that honors you and that pleases you? If Jesus, you were sitting right next to me watching this, would you be going, this is great stuff? You go, now, 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 wait, Pastor, you're buttoning into my life now. Back off now, back. And now you got into my, my free time, my, my evening. You know, I'm just saying, what if we looked at that and asked God? You said, well, if, I, if I'm only going to watch something that pleases Jesus, I'm never going to watch anything. That's not true. You can find good stuff. But I mean, just look and say, is this, think it through. Grapple with it. Think about your day. And am I surrendering everything to Jesus? And then when you lay down at the end of the day, you put your head on a pillow. And you say, God, I just, I, I give you this day that I've lived if there's things I could, could grow and learn and do better, show me that. And Lord, as I wake up tomorrow, let me once again give this day to you. I put myself in your hands. I surrender to you. I put my life on the altar. God says that's true and proper worship. You're worshiping God all day long if you're surrendering to him. And God delights in that and celebrates that. And then next, never surrender to the will, ways, and the wonders of this world. Never surrender to the will, the ways, and the wonders of this world. As you read Romans 12, 1 and 2, here's what we read. Therefore, I urge you, my brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Now, here's what we're going to focus on now. 
do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. There are patterns. There are ways that the world functions that if we're not careful, we're just kind of in the flow. We're in the current. And if you're in a river and there's a current flowing and you're not swimming and you're not paddling, you're just floating and you float with the current. And there's things in the current of our culture that are just there. And if we're not careful, we're going to float right along with them. But, but, but here we're, th- we're thinking about understanding to not be conformed to the pattern of the world, not to be kind of sucked into it, drawn along with it, but to live in a way that is honoring to God. So what, you know, what are some of the things that become normal in our world? And let me tell you something. There's nothing happening in our world right now that wasn't happening back in the days of Jesus. People, oh, the world's so terrible. The world, people are in so much conflict. There was, trust me, there was conflict back then. Well, there's wars. There were, there were wars back then. Well, there's tension. There's, there's political things. There was stuff back then. I mean, it's, the world's always been... Conv- the difference now is you go click, 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 and all the bad news in the world is right in your hands on a, or on a screen. We see it all. We hear it all. But the world's always had challenges. And so, and so what does it look like to say, I'm not going to be conformed to the patterns of this world? Let me give you three really good words to kind of put in your vocabulary and in your thinking. One is this. Look at areas that the world wills us to surrender. Where there's areas where the world says, come on, comply, get in line with this. And let me give you a, a great word, relativism. Relativism. Our world loves relativism. There's no truth, there's no absolutes. You have your truth, I have my truth, just you do it your way. You do it. And, and, and it's almost seen as offensive to actually say, no, I actually believe there is truth. People say, well, that, you know, that's not my truth. And the problem is God says, I'm the, I, am, I am truth and I'm the giver of truth. Well, some people may not like that. That's okay, they don't have to like it, but we as Christians believe that there is actually truth. So beware of relativism that says there is no truth, anything is equally true if somebody believes it with conviction. And then look at the ways of the world. What are the ways of the world that I need to be careful of and that I need to guard against? And, and here's, if you're a note taker, write this word down. He, I'm going to wait for the plane, wait for the plane. There you go. Uh, the, ways of, the word is hedonism. Hedonism. Hedonism is this. I want it. I like it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to take it. Hedonism is me, 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 more, more, more. Hedonism is, 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 always has to please me and bring me pleasure. We live in a very hedonistic world. This is, if, it, if you like it and you enjoy it, you have a right to do it. But sometimes God says, you know, sometimes you actually forsake the things you love to do or you want to do for my glory, to walk in my ways. So beware of relativism. Beware of hedonism. And then look at the wonders of the world they kind of get more and more exciting and they're kind of out there dazzling and sparkling and be careful of those. And here's the third word, relativism, hedonism, and then consumerism. We live in a consumeristic world. Buy, buy, acquire, acquire, more, more. Stuff, 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 stuff. And just kind of consume. And we, be, we become consumers. And we have to be careful. Now again, these are things that are part of the current of our world. There's nothing wrong with having stuff. It's just a matter of when that stuff has you and owns you. It's a problem. And so be careful. You know, beware of relativism, hedonism, consumerism. All these things are kind of part of the, kind of the flow of the world. And if you're not paying attention, you just start kind of floating downstream and all of a sudden you're thinking and acting like everyone does because that's part of our world. Be aware of that. So it just here's a couple of things to think about. Be careful of making your work an idol in your life. When your work becomes more important than people, be careful. That's one of the things that in our culture you have to be careful of. Man, the, God calls us to work hard. I think Christians should be the hardest workers in any environment they're in. But if that work becomes your idol and it's more important than people, it's a problem. Be careful if you love money and things more than you love people. Because God says two things matter in the universe. Loving God, loving people. And the other stuff all takes a distant second, third, fourth, or fifth. Be careful of pride. Our culture talks, you know, it just says, you know, be, be, not, not pride in the sense of I feel good about something I accomplished and I worked really hard at it, but pride that says I'm arrogant and I'm better than everybody else. Beware of that. I think in our world right now, beware of division and tribalism. Tribalism is, you're on my team, we're together on a team, and everybody else, we hate them. They're bad, they're evil. And we wish, we wish ill on them. Our world's getting like that. Man, if you're on the other side of the aisle of almost any aisle these days, it's almost you can't talk and be friends and shake hands and share a meal and laugh and talk and be humane to other people. Be careful when we, and if you're a Christian who looks and says, I like people who agree with me, and anyone who doesn't agree with me, I hate them and wish them ill, then you have to say, do I have the heart of Jesus in me? Beware, but that, that's so much part of our world right now. Beware of, of tribalism. And then also beware of just trusting in yourself, self-sufficiency. I can take care of everything myself. So here's a question. 
Where are you tempted to surrender to the world? Where is it that the world is kind of moving along and the current's moving and you just kind of look around and you go, oh, boy, I'm drifting downstream and I'm not even paying attention. And I'm, and I'm just living just like the world and it's not a good way to live. It's not in line with Jesus. And look for those things and watch out for those things and say, I want to, I want to follow God. I want to honor him. Romans 12, 1 and 2, another lesson. The road to transformation. So we're not going to be conformed to the world, but listen to this. Now we're going to talk about a changed mind. So back to Romans 12, 1 and 2. A changed mind. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Now here's what we're going to focus on now. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't be conformed to the patterns and the ways of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good will, his pleasing will, his perfect will. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Here's the question. How can you do a mind renewal project? How do we renew our minds? Because the longer we live in the world and the longer we're around certain things, it's just like, oh, that must be okay. Because why? Because everyone does it. I've seen it a thousand times. And it just seems fine. How do you renew your thinking? How do you renew your mind? Here's a few thoughts that will help you. Number one, be careful of what I put into my mind. What am I putting into my mind? What am I watching? What am I listening to? What am I seeing with my eyes, hearing with my ears that's going in and shaping my thinking? Well, what I watch doesn't shape my thinking. What I listen to doesn't shape my thinking. Oh, yes, it does. That's why advertisers spend millions of dollars trying to get you to look at things and hear certain things. They know it will shape how you think. So what am I putting into my mind? And if there's stuff you're putting into your mind that you know is not making you more like Jesus, be careful of that. Beware of that. And then the second thing, what do I block out? Are there things that you just, there should be some things that you say, I'm going to block that out. I'm going to stop focusing on that. I've been trying to do that lately with political stuff. There's a lot going on in the political world. I'm not saying don't be, I think you should be totally aware. And I wrote a letter to the congregation recently, totally aware, totally prayerful. And you should look to the scriptures and you should, you should as a Christian, be heard in this world and let your vo voice be heard and your vote be heard. I think we should be engaged and aware. But we could end up spending hours and hours every single day on a news loop and just getting so wound up and so frustrated and so upset. And so I decided a while back, I need to watch less news and pray more. That was my big decision. I've not been doing a very good job of it. I ended up getting sucked back in again. But I, so here's the prayer I've been trying to pray. Every time I start getting sucked in and getting kind of wound up about stuff, I try to pray this. And I, I, I just, you can write this one down. I just stole it from Jesus. And he wants you to take this one, okay? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In, in heaven. Lord, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so every time, and even when I'm talking to somebody else who starts getting wound up about political stuff, I'll say, thanks for sharing that. Can we pray real quick? Lord, we pray your kingdom will come. Your will will be done. And I, I'm praying a little bit more and getting wound up a little bit less. And actually when I pray, I feel a bit more peace. And I have this suspicion. Let me test this on everybody. Test this on the folks at home. I think my prayers will have more power than my anxiety. What do you think about that? <laughs> I think my prayers will make a bigger difference than just being, ah, you know, because it's just, it's, it's just craziness, right? And so I'm, I'm trying to pray more. That, so I'm actually trying to block out certain things. What am I putting in? What am I blocking out? Um, watch out for wrong narratives. Uh, there's a class that Sherry and a team of our people at our church have been teaching uh, that's going through The Good and Beautiful God. It's three different books. And they're actually, these classes are actually online right now. You can go and watch The Good and Beautiful God classes. And if you're not sure what they are, you can call us and we'll show you how to find that. But it's changing the narratives in your mind from my narratives or the world's narratives to God's narratives. So let me give you a couple examples, okay? There's a voice that says of you, there's a voice that says you are worthless and a voice that says you are royalty. A royal son or daughter of the living God. And there's another voice that says you're worthless. The world and the enemy will say you're worthless. That's a lie. God says you are royalty. You are children of the living God, the King of Kings. Those narratives will make a difference in what you're thinking about. The world will say God is this angry, vengeful God. The scripture says God is a tender protector who hates sin, but he loves you and gave his life to protect you. You need to hear that. The world will tell you the future is hopeless. Man, if we don't do this, this, and this in the next six months or two years, the world's gonna end. There's a lot of that going on. I mean, and you just fill in the blanks, all kinds of stuff. 
and you look to God and God says, I'm on the throne. I rule and reign. Matter of fact, Psalm 139 says, every day of your life was written in God's book before one of them came to be. He's on the throne. He's got you. What narratives are you listening to? Train your mind to listen to the narratives of God, that listen to what this book says. The power of Scripture. There's a reason why I encourage every Christian to read this book every single day. There's a reason why every week of the year, I spent last week working on the Christmas series, and for every week of the Christmas series, I've laid out Bible readings that fit with the sermons, so you have a Bible passage to read every day of the year. We do this every single week, and if, and if Pastor Roy preaches or Pastor Keith preaches, they lay out a reading plan for that week. Why? Because we want you opening this book, because filling your mind with this book will renew your mind and make you think in different ways. I encourage you to open the book every day and then ask for the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit to guide you every step of the way. And then finally, just to close, a vision of a surrendered life. That we get this vision of a surrendered life. So let's read the whole passage one more time. Follow along in your Bibles, on your apps. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy... To offer your bodies, all you are, as a living sacrifice. Put your life on the altar every day, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Don't, don't let it sweep you along. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Think in new ways. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. You know what His will for you is? His good pleasing and perfect will. When you walk in God's will, it is good, it is pleasing, it is perfect. It's a better way to live. We don't feel that way sometimes because we haven't tried walking that pathway over time. But when you do, you find a life that's just that's beyond description in terms of its glory and beauty and peace and joy. So here's the question. Will you establish a lifestyle of testing your life for the glory of Jesus? L listen to what the passage says. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. Am I living in God's will? How do I test it? How do I approve and affirm that? His good, pleasing, and perfect will. You ask yourself good questions. You ask yourself questions every day. Am I using my time in a way that really glorifies Jesus? Am I using my time in a way that really glorifies Jesus? And ask yourself that question. Am I making being face-to-face -face with Jesus, spending time with him, a priority every day of my life? Ask yourself that question. Are my words filled with grace and kindness or they have sharp edges and are they bitter? What are my words like? Ask that question. I want to live in the will of God His good, pleasing, and perfect will. So I'm going to ask myself these questions. Do the things I watch and consume help me be more like Jesus or drive me away from Jesus? Ask the question. Are the people I'm spending time with, people who are helping me walk more closely with Jesus, or am I helping them walk more closely with Jesus? Or are they pulling me away from the Savior? Ask God those questions. This passage, these two verses, open up for us this understanding of living a life that's surrendered to God is the best life to live. God, we pray together right now that as we think about these first 11 chapters of Romans, the truth that we've learned, the, the orthodoxy, the, the correct beliefs, Lord, that we believe. We believe that you are a God who is righteous, who is faithful. We believe that you, you've offered salvation, that you're sovereign, you're on the throne. We believe you conquered sin and conquered death and you offer us the best life possible. So therefore, we pray that we will live more like you. We will follow you more closely. We will take our lives every day and put ourselves on the altar and say, God, all that I am and all that I have and all that I dream and all that I long for, I put into your hands. Help me know your will for my life. Help me walk in that will. And Lord, I pray right now for every person in the courtyard, for every person in their car gathered here in worship, for every person at home or somewhere online. I pray, Lord, that that area that you struck in our heart early on in this message the area where our life's not quite aligned and we're kind of bobbling and bumping along the road because what we know we believe and how we live don't line up. I pray that your Holy Spirit would give us a conviction and power and strength to live in new ways. That what we believe would shape who we are and how we live. That our I believe will become our I will. As we walk with you and follow you, Jesus, for your glory, we pray this. And everyone in their cars, in the courtyard, and at home said, Amen. 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 Before I send you off, 
Uh, first, uh, a special welcome to our folks online to a live service. Everyone in the courtyard, I want you to, on three, I'm going to have you yell, good morning, one, two, three. So good morning from the courtyard. Everybody in your cars, over here, get ready on your horns. On three, I want you to honk. One, two, three. Okay, good. There you go. Okay, that's enough. Thank you. Thank you. Get enthusiastic. <laughs> that's your praise the Lord for the morning. Thank you. And everyone at home, uh, we want to remind you that the services are at 9 and 11 because we're streaming. It's not going to change. We're going to start right at 9. We're going to start right at 11. So we invite you to come back and join us next week. Everyone in the courtyard in their cars, be sure you go online and that you register. A couple other things before I send you off with a word of blessing. A couple other things. If you want prayer, people at home, uh, there's, there is a uh, phone, wait, prayer. There is an email address, prayer at shoreline.church on your screen right now. You can uh, connect with that, uh, that address and share your prayer and we'll pray for you here in the courtyard or in the cars, right in the back by the connection booth, just to the left of that. We got a team there that is ready to pray for you. So go and join them for prayer in just a moment after we dismiss you. Um, if you're new today in the courtyard, there's a welcome booth back there. Head to the welcome booth. There's some uh, balloons up there. They want to give you a gift, answer your questions, and thank you for coming. So pop by there on your way out of here. And at home, if you're new, we want you to go to the phone number you see on the screen, and we'll send you a digital connection card, and we'll follow up with you at home right away. And, so, and then also Operation Christmas Child. Every year, uh, we give hundreds of these boxes that get sent all over the world. And they go to children that are underprivileged, and they share the hope of Christmas and a great uh, collection of gifts and the story of Jesus. And so if you want to be part of that in the courtyard, as you leave today, you're going to find it every one of the exits, there's a table with the boxes. Pick up one or two of those. There's instructions what to fill it with. Let's do that, bring them back, and we're going to send those out all over the world. And if you're online, what you can do, there's two ways you can get a Christmas box to send out. One is call the church and set up a time you can come by and pick it up and we'll be ready for you. And someone will hand that off to you. Or on Wednesdays, Tuesdays and Thursdays, hundreds of people come here to get food at our food pantry. But on Wednesdays, we come as a church and drop food off for the next week to go out to people, all right? So you can come on Wednesday between 11 and 2 o'clock at the food drop-off, and if you want to drop off some food, you can, but you can also pick up, we'll have a bunch of those boxes there. At the, is that right, David? We'll have them over there at the, connect, at the uh, food pantry, and you can pick what, one between 11 and 2 o'clock online. Come by this week on Wednesday and pick that up. And then finally, uh, if you want to know more about Shoreline Church and want to le learn more of what it means to become a member of Shoreline Church, I'm leading a class 100% online at 1 o'clock today. That gives you time to make it home, to get online, you can either go to Patty right now and say, I want to register for the class. And what we want is we want to get you a, a link to the outline, that I, my teaching outline about Shoreline Church, and also a link to join online so we can be in the Zoom all together on my big computer screen. And we'll hang out together and have a class at 1 o'clock. And online, you're going to see right there, just email Patty, and she will send you those materials. And so I will see some of you who feel like you want to do that at 1 o'clock today. And now I want to invite you, uh, as I send you off from here, just to receive this word of blessing. May you walk an understanding of the truth of God. May all that you believe transform who you are becoming. May your I believe become your I will. And may that one area of life that God sort of whispered to your heart that needs to come into alignment, will you surrender that to Jesus every day this week and watch as you come into alignment with him, you will experience his good and pleasing and perfect will in beautiful ways. And when you stumble... And we all do. Get back up, dust yourself off, and keep on walking. And when you do well, all glory and praise to Jesus. God bless you. Have a great week, and we will see you next Sunday. Have a great week. Oh, and real quick, in the courtyard at home, God bless you. Have a great week. You can stay online if you want to. Here, you can drive out safely in the courtyard. Our team's going to come and dismiss you. Put your mask back on when you walk out, and wait till you're dismissed so we can dismiss in an orderly fashion. God bless you. Have a great week.